And that is one of the newest videos by, his name is Bamzi, but actually his real name is Harrison uh, Munio Kariba. I didn't even know that. I've just always known him as Bamzi, not even Bamziggy. Bamziggy Ziggy. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us in no studio. No problem. Thanks for having me. Um, and so my director, first thing you walked in, she was mm. like, wow, he looks so different. That's not the Bamzi I remember. Yeah, I've changed a lot. Yeah. So I'm a bit chubbier, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, I shaved the hair. Yeah. And yeah, I've changed a lot. You can tell my experience has made me, you know, look at life differently. Okay. And, yeah, yeah. and it's those specific experiences that we're mm. talking about. It says there on our caption, we are back. Yeah. We're meant to have you in gym. What says that he's on his way. So yeah. when he comes in, um, we'll be speaking to him about that. But the very public struggle mm -hmm. um, of addiction. So yeah. talk to me about that. Well, um, you know, in a nutshell, I, I you know, I, I was doing really well with everything. Uh, I got to a point in my life where I was um, successful in all areas. I got, I, I ventured also into media, as you may know, mm -hmm. or, I used to, or some people may not know. I was doing radio, and then all of a sudden, I got addicted, to, heavily addicted to drugs. When I say drugs, I was, it was the hardcore drugs like heroin. People don't even know that heroin was around in Kenya. Even till today, when I mention heroin, they don't know that it's uh, it was around. Was this? this was. Um, Wow, 2000. Okay, let me. Know. I started, you know, meddling with drugs, the heavy drugs, in around um, around 2004, 2005. But around 2007, there, yeah, that's when it got really bad. When I got addicted to heroin, because uh, before I used to dabble with uh, other drugs like cocaine, um, marijuana, um, what do you call this, uh, alcohol. Mm -hmm. But when I started taking heroin, that's when it got really bad because it's very addictive. It takes over. It takes over completely. So before we get to the addiction itself, mm. how do you even begin? Where did you get access to these drugs? That's a lot of people don't know that. Yeah, Nairobi how did you even is, think is a hub. One day to, okay. Yeah, it is. You find it everywhere. People don't know. Like. Um, you know, I usually, usually when I tell these stories, people think I'm selling them out, but it's true. In the clubs, everywhere you go, security guards from, um, uh, especially dealers, they ha they target uh, clubs. You know, the the, uh, the well-known clubs, especially with people who have money. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a club that uh, has a like a pricey menu, or whatever, they target people like that. Um, because cocaine is expensive, mm -hmm. yeah, and um, marijuana, obviously, uh, most people know that you usually get them in the ghetto or whatever. So it's like classes. The drugs have got classes. The weed, okay, nowadays there's high grade weed, which is more for the up tempo or high class area, middle class area, uh, uh, you know, guys. And then there's um, um, the high class drugs like ecstasy, cocaine, and heroin. And heroin is kind of by, I can say it's, it's for the middle class and for the poor as well because it's sold in, in um, how can I say, like sashes. You okay. know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, but I mean, what, so as we see in the mm. movies, yeah, like yeah. little bags. Yeah, right, exactly. So, because so, like in cocaine, they don't sell less than a gram and a gram is 5,000 5, bob. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard for someone who doesn't have that kind of money to buy cocaine. Okay. But for heroin, what they do is they can uh, cut it into small little pieces where you can buy a piece for or a hit for 100 shillings. Right. That's why someone who's got, you know, not who lives on the street, who begs, for, for example, can afford a hit. So that, that's the difference with the, the kind of drugs, um, how it's people sell them. So let's go back to that first hit, yeah. that first high. Yeah. Um, talk to me through that day. I'm sure you remember it very well. Um, yeah, it was in Mombasa. I was with a few friends. And um, what happened is... I just woken up from a hangover, you know, we were partying and everything. And then another friend of mine uh, said he wanted to get some drugs, and um, was this normal in your friend circle? For yeah, it was. Like, oh, yeah, it, 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 it was. It was. It's like you know, ordering like you wake up in the morning. Some people don't, you know, they want to keep the party going. Mm. You know, some people didn't sleep, you know, and they want to keep the party going. And um, what happened is, uh, what we wanted, because those days I never used to take heroin. Um, we couldn't find, the guy who sold us the cocaine or whatever wasn't awake at that time, but probably had gone to sleep. And um, they found that the guy for heroin was around. And they said, I don't take that. So their friends decided to order some. And that's how it started, you know. Oh, have a hit, it's okay, just try it out. And that's, that's how it started. I took one hit, I didn't like it. I threw up, I didn't like it at all. But then later on, two years later, something happened to me emotionally. I was in, you know, uh, I think it was, uh, it was something with my girlfriend. I don't know what happened. It was an argument or something. And I felt like feeling that same way I felt the first time I took the hit of heroin. You understand? Mm -hmm. So I went looking for it because I knew where to get it. Because mm -hmm. a friend of mine had taken me there. I used to take my friend there to get some. Then that's how it started. But you're looking for this heroin two years later. Mm. Were you still consistently on cocaine? No, no, no. It was on and off. Mm -hmm. On and off. I wasn't addicted to anything at that point mm -hmm. except cigarettes. Okay. 
I wasn't addicted to anything at that point. And when I started taking heroin, that was, uh, you, know, you know, you don't know how addicted it's going to be. You think it's like going to be like anything else. Because you could take cocaine from Monday to Friday and not get addicted to it. I thought it was the same thing with heroin. It wasn't like that. You know, you take it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and um, you skip the fourth day and you're feeling kind of, you have symptoms like a flu, kind of, you know? Your nose is running, you probably got diarrhea, your elbows and knees, the joints are aching, and then you're wondering, what's going on? And then someone told me, when's the last time you took a hit? I was like, it's been a few, it's been like a day. I would try taking a hit and tell me how you feel. I did and I felt okay. And then someone told me, okay, you've got a hoax. Okay. And that was really when I got started getting scared and I didn't know what to do and you know, denial hits in, you know. You start telling yourself, I'll go through it, it's only a hundred bob, you know, I'll get through it and then after almost two years and this, that's when I admitted to my family that I needed help because right. I got and really before bad. that conversation begins with your family, mm. um, you're telling me there was a realization, personal realization yeah. that you were addicted. Yeah. And this is how long after you had been taking the drugs? Um like I said, the, the, the stage of denial can be, it's according to, it, it varies from people. Mine was really long. It was like um, almost a year and a half. Just saying to yourself, I'm going to get okay. over this. Yeah. I don't really need this. I don't this. really, you know, I, I, I'm cool. Uh -huh. You know, it's not like see, I'm stealing. It's not like I'm that guy on the street mm -hmm. who's, you know, begging on the street. It's not like my life is okay. I go to work, I pay my bills, I do, you know, I'm, I'm fine. So you and were a functioning yeah, addict. Yeah, uh, that's what it is, a functioning addict. Mm -hmm. That's what it was, exactly until um, things got really, really bad. I started spending more money than I was, uh, I was making, and I started, my, my health deteriorated, my relationship deteriorated with my family members and uh, the, 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 the person I was, I was seeing at that time. And um, you know, everything just started going really bad. And there are side effects as well to taking the drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, for example, uh, you have, uh, for some people, there's constipation and you get other, other kinds of, you know, sicknesses to it. So my health deteriorated a lot. Oh my God, I was so skinny, very skinny. So, you know, people could tell. And I used to drift. I started, uh, I started getting even more depressed because what happens is you take the heroin or the drugs to get well because you're with, in withdrawal. In fact, they call it in the street, kupona. Mm -hmm. So you take it to get well, kupona. So taking the drug is called kupona. Yeah, because okay. you know, if you don't take it, you're in serious, serious withdrawal. It's the worst withdrawal in the world. In fact, I, I know people who commit suicide because they don't want to feel that way. Can you imagine? Someone actually kills themselves because they don't have the money or the drugs to, to not feel that way, mm -hmm. so they'd rather die. Mm -hmm. So first you take it kupona, then you take it to get high because you're enjoying it. Mm -hmm. And then now what happens is um, the guilt hits you because you take it and you get well, right? Then you start feeling really bad because, you know, I've gone to the point where I have, I have to take this drug to get well. I have to take this drug to function. You know, I can't eat without taking it. And you start feeling guilty. You know? So you literally become hooked okay. to it. When yeah. they say hooked, they really mean it. Yeah. Um, and how do you even begin this conversation with your parents? Because by this wow. time, yeah. I'm assuming they've already sort of heard murmurs and rumors. People no. are writing about it. Actually, no. I yeah. was a really, I, I was, you know, like I said, I was a functioning addict as well. You know, I think they, they suspected something, but I think they thought it was maybe I was drinking too much, maybe I was going out too much because obviously my weight had deteriorated, mm -hmm. my health had deteriorated. But they never thought it was hard drugs. You know, you understand? You never yeah. think that your kid is going to be that one who's taking. And, and, then, and then again, where do you get those kind of drugs in Kenya? The worst they probably knew was Bangi, which, you know, that one, you know, uh, once in a while I'd been caught around, maybe in school, high school, dabbling. That, that's fine. Uh, they probably thought that that's what I was taking or, or whatever, if they thought I was taking drugs at all. But they never knew. When I told them, they were in total shock. And total. how did you begin this conversation? Did someone have to hold your hand as you no. did it? Or it was no, I was alone. I was alone. No one knew. This is another thing. You, you suffer with that secret by yourself because obviously you don't want to tell anybody. You're scared of telling anybody. You're scared of being judged. It took me so long, I would say months, practicing in my head how I'm going to start that conversation. Yeah? Before I actually did it, I remember it took me almost a week going to my parents' place. I need to talk to you guys about something. Then I got, get there. Immediately, I, like, I knock maybe on their, their room. I, I, I open the door. Just when I'm about to say it, I change the story. I say, oh, why no. did Why did they need to know? Why did you need to tell um, them? Because I knew I couldn't do it without support, family support, because I researched on what, what to do. Uh, rehab um, was going to take about three months. You need a family support, you need a therapy. You, you, it's, it's something I wouldn't have done without their help. Mm -hmm. 
So talk to me about the day you tell them. You knock on their door. Assumably mm -hmm. they've been expecting this conversation. Yeah. Uh, they've been expecting some form of discussion. Probably, yeah. And then you sit down with them Actually, and tell them. surprisingly, they took it really well, surprisingly. Uh -huh. You know, I expected, oh, flares, you know, you know, uh, being judged or whatever. But what did you say? You sit well, down. Well, I, uh, I can't remember the words exactly. I just said I have a problem. I remember I said I have a problem and it's with drugs. I'm addicted to this kind of drugs and you can get them here, here. And then my parents start saying, okay, and you've been suspecting something like that is happening. You know, we could, we could tell that you're not yourself. Mm -hmm. We didn't know what it was and we were worried, but we didn't know what it was, but we were grateful that she came to tell me and you know, um, now we can, we, can, we can face this problem together. And I told them I already know, I already did the research of where to go, which doctors to see. And um, they were just glad that I told them. I think, you know, the, the thing is a lot of people fear telling their parents mm -hmm. or their loved ones that they're going through this situation, but they would rather know and help you out, and then you know you guys move into move forward together, than you suffering and going through it alone, and them not knowing what's going on with you, and then you know racking their brain and worrying every time that you go out and you don't come back for two days. You know okay. what I mean? So I'd advise anybody out there who's suffering with this uh, the, this kind of situation or this kind of uh, with drug abuse, and you don't want to tell your people around you or your parents or your loved ones they are the number one people to tell because no matter what happens they're still going to be your family it right. doesn't matter yeah um and so the rehabilitation process begins mm. that was hard you had done well. a bit of research yeah it wasn't what you were expecting no you know how you see movies you know people sit in a circle and say hi my name is harrison Bamzi manadi that's the same thing that happens but um it, it was it, it was harder than that because talking about feelings to strangers is very hard in a group it's therapy that's what it is basically you know it's like school basically you just go by boarding school you go in you wake up you have chores you learn um you go families i mean group sessions family sessions and classes uh, to teach you on how to you know s uh, survive in the outside world as a addict or ex-addict mm -hmm. for three months and why did you find it hard um the, it was hard for me because of um the, the, the group sessions and those are the ones by the way that help the most uh, sharing your feelings and experiences uh, experiences with strangers was very hard for me and that had to be done every day you sit in a circle with people in, in rehab you know people you don't know and uh, the, you know the, the it goes around everyone has a turn whether to you know to say something or not so it comes to my turn I, I, I'm like hi my name is Harrison and I'm an addict hi Harrison I'm feeling this way this way this mm -hmm. way um, you know when I was taking drugs it hurt my family this way this way this way I lost this I lost that that's how you express yourself. And it takes a while before you get to that rhythm. So when it comes to your turn, you can, they don't force you, you can pass. You just say pass. But eventually, when you start talking, that's when it, it helps. It really helps to get that, you know, those feelings out there. Okay, and the mm. people you met in rehab without obviously disclosing their identities, yeah. did it surprise you? Um, the class, mm -hmm. the creed, the yeah. ages? Yeah, Who yeah. gets addicted to drugs? Every, in ev ev demo every demographic, every race, it doesn't matter. Old, I met um, old women mm -hmm. addicted to um, Mira, people who are grandmothers. I met people who are younger than me. I met um, uh, mothers with babies who have, uh, who uh, babies were born addicted to a drug mm -hmm. already. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I met all kinds of people from uh, lawyers to uh, even ministers, it, don't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't choose, drug addiction doesn't choose, it goes for anybody, anybody can, and people don't understand, I used to think that it was a choice, it's just that people don't say, why didn't you just stop taking drugs? Mm. It's a disease, this is one of the things you learn in rehab, it's a disease just like cancer, just like AIDS or anything else, that's why people, people have to understand that, it's not something that can just be switched off, yeah. you know, um, some people can get it, some people can't, in fact, uh, uh, some of the things they're teaching us in rehab is that it was genetic, it's, it's genetically passed on, which is, um, you know, there's no proof completely 100%, but there's something they were telling us could be, and they tell us it's a disease. So uh, once, like, my family understood that, you know, that it was a disease. Family f therapy also helps, by the way, because uh, your family comes in, like, maybe once a month, mm -hmm. and you guys sit down with a counselor and you talk it through, and then the, the, they say how the, this experience has hurt them yeah. and vice versa, and you guys learn from each other, and that helped a lot as well. Okay, um, but... When you were in rehab, obviously mm. you were with like-minded people, people mm. who've gone through the same experiences, yeah. and then you're uprooted from that. After three months, you've mm. been living in a bubble, and you go out into the real world. Mm. You meet your friends, yeah. the guys who used to take hits with you are there, mm. 
Um, so how do you deal with that? that uh, that's one of the things that you're taught. You have to cut those ties immediately. Was that Your difficult? life changes very, very. In fact, um, uh, at the end of rehab, you know, you start getting scared of um, going out, actually. In fact, you, you know, you, rehab has become so safe. It's funny because at first you don't want to go to rehab. Then you don't want to leave mm. because you're scared of going to the outside world. And then everything changes. You have to understand it's not easy. I'm not going to lie to you that it's easy. You change, you have to change. I change my telephone number, the people I hang around with, um, my routines, even um, the, the, the job I had at that time, I didn't go back to that kind of work. Mm -hmm. I had to take a break. Um, you know, I, I was advised by my uh, psychiatrist, you know, you, t you take a break. If you can, even don't go to work for, for me because pressure also is a trigger. Yeah. The kind of movies you watch, I think we're talking about this off air, you know, the kind of movies you watch also triggers, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Because if you're watching a movie, an action movie, and someone does drugs in that movie, that alone can trigger you to, to um, want to take a hit of the, your drug of choice. Yeah. So everything has to change. Your lifestyle completely, the friends you keep, um, the kind of tabias you have, the food you eat, everything. You have to change everything. Okay. Mm. And so the timing for this is very deliberate because we're going into the holiday season. Yeah. And that's when people are feeling, to use a Swahili phrase, yeah. kujiachilia. Yes. So you want to try things, you want to experiment things, mm -hmm. and you're saying, like you said earlier, mm. it can happen to it me. It can. But how easy is it to get a date? Very. In fact, my first, uh, we're talking about my first time to take her rain, was actually in December. Yeah. Uh, December like this, yeah. in Mombasa. And it's very, very easy. And especially in our country, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, I, I love where I come where I'm from, but Kenya in East Africa and this side of the world is like the hub for this kind of drugs to come in. So, and uh, it's, you know, especially Nairobi and Mombasa, you know how us guys are. We, are. we have all sorts of people from all over the world. You know what I mean? Multicultural city and Mombasa as well. So, especially people from abroad. They love it also because our grade of drugs is also very good. You understand? So they could be, they could be in London and they want some cocaine. It first of all, it be too expensive and it won't be as good as we have it here. Okay. So that alone, we have a reputation for that kind of stuff as well. Oof, okay, this yeah. conversation is getting intense. Why don't we yeah. take a short break and listen to no uh, some of Bamzu's music and also Jim Watt's music, who is coming, um, joining us on the couch briefly. You remember Jim Watt, you know? Kumbeni under 18, yeah, that guy, he's back and he's got one story to tell. Um, so why don't we enjoy the music? We'll be right back. Ya kutiribika, leo mambo kufurai ya kuna kujamu Life is stressing sika tai lakini blessing kuwa hai ndo mana kila furai The uni bidi na furai, sahi siku misha ingi ya club So we are back and Jim Watt now joins us in the studio. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. It's been a while since we saw you. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. And then there was a whole campaign of people asking, where is Jim Watt, where is Jim Watt? Yeah. And you come out and we find out that you've been struggling with a drug addiction as well. Yeah been through much more downs than ups yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me about that. how are you doing yeah I'm, I'm fine i'm fine yeah thank you uh yeah you know just like bamzi was uh mentioning about drugs usually starts like a routine um you know how guys young guys you know when you're from work and everything you just got paid you want a party kidogo so it depends when you're starting out it starts like a hobby but when it gets to be more than a hobby that it requires you to put more time mm. when you're supposed to be doing other 
productive things. That's where the problem is. Okay, so yeah. how, did you, how did your addiction begin? When did it begin? <coughs> um, I, I can't put a specific time, time gap on it, because usually with the music industry, we have a lot of free time, because we usually work on weekends. That's when you're doing shows. So during the weeks, during the weekdays, uh, if you don't have any studio sessions or anything, you just have free time. You can go and start binge drinking or something. So it starts just like a hobby. You just want to William Mozambili. Then when I realize from Monday to Friday, we mm -hmm. Marakata to in a week. Mm -hmm. Then the next week, we may blend in a weekend. Mm -hmm. Then when I get, after a couple of months or in a year, you need to drink to maybe stop shaking or something. What was the Magakama jokes? Mm -hmm. end up to a lock. Mm -hmm. But when I get a design, you are, f you are now a functioning alcoholic. Because, mm. yeah, he's been, he's been through some other drugs and everything. Mm. But alcohol, in a school, lightly. But that's what's really messed me up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I like what you said, alcohol is taken lightly. Usually we say, ah, sooner Julie, nani yo kunywa. Are we really taking it seriously, the issue of addiction? Uh, because Bamzi is telling me that when it comes to harder drugs, we're ignoring them because yeah. we assume that we don't have access to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. When it comes to alcohol, we're like, it's just alcohol. Yeah, when do al alcohol, it, socially, it's accepted. Mm -hmm. So even like when I'm online, I'm checking like research on alcohol and everything. It's really minimal mm -hmm. guys who have like issues that they can relate with alcohol or anything. But when you get to try and get more insight, like it's the older the generation, the guys who have been drinking for long and everything, the guys with kidney problems and everything, mm -hmm. those are the guys who really feel the effects of alcohol. Okay. But the young guys, apart from the health risks and everything, also messing us. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so let me ask specifically with this December season, because that's when a lot of people, as we were speaking earlier, mm. yeah. let loose. And you will hear people say things like, oh man, I was drunk from Monday to Monday, that mm. holiday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it possible in that small window to get addicted? Yeah, yes. you can. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In fact, uh, like, like you're saying, uh, for, for Jimot, uh, I forgot to mention, it's harder. I may think it's harder for people who have alcohol as their drug of choice. Mm -hmm to get through it. It's, in fact, that's what we should emphasize more than anything in this country because think about it. You open a paper, mm -hmm. it's been advertised. When you're driving in a matatu, there's a bar everywhere. You know what I mean? Yeah. It, the temptation there is there. Like I was talking about triggers. You know, the temptation is there. Imagine you just come out of rehab. You're trying to get clean. You enter matatu. You go two blocks, there's a, there's a bar. You uh, go to your phone, you're going through the internet, there's an advertisement for Suji, you know, a pub. You're trying to go to uh, a, a party, uh, you've been invited on the weekend, there's alcohol everywhere. Mm. For hard drugs, it's not like that. You have to go look for it. It's not like they advertised anywhere, you know? So I think that's one of the things we have to emphasize more for alcohol. Yeah. For more for in, in this country, yeah. we have to take preventive, preventive me measures. And for people who have gotten addicted, <coughs> where can they go? You know, this is like this is a good thing that we're doing right now because we're, 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 there's awareness for people. Yeah. To know. People don't know where to go. But I also know you're working very deliberately yeah. to create those places, exactly. those safe spaces where people can go talk. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that. Well, for right now, what we do is like with Jimon, I know we people come to us on Facebook or, um, or online. Uh, but what I try to do is I try to go to, for shows like this and tell people, give guys a hotline number, where to go, and tell them that there is help, you can get help, and you're not alone. And um, uh, for people, because so, obviously there's also guys, uh, people who have money, because uh, it, it can be expensive, obviously. It's a disease like yeah. anything. Uh, hospital bills are expensive. And there's also alternatives of um, what to do if you don't have that kind of cash. Okay. So basically right now what I do is like, oh, I try and tweet about it every now and then on my Facebook. I use uh, my, my time to, to come for interviews like this. I, uh, we talk about my stories. Mm. This is one of the things I decided that I'll, I'm gonna do when I kind of got out of rehab, or Ramzi, because you're in the limelight or whatever. What are you gonna, are you gonna hide the situation or yeah. are you gonna talk about it and uh, help people? All right, yeah. before we get to Jimot, can you give us the hotline number so that if anyone is watching, I mean, it could save a life? <laughs> um, well, I gave it to your producers earlier because right. there are so many and all they right. change all the time. So what we're going to do in that yeah. case, we're going to have them scroll at the bottom um, of your screen mm. there. Actually, it's there, the hotline yeah. number in case of help. That's um, Jerome Lane yeah, Clinic. It, it's already on the screens yeah. right now. It mm. says in case in case of help, there's a hotline number there. Jimot, yeah. getting out of the addiction. So you've gone for rehab yeah. and you're feeling well.
and you're now back. Yeah. Was that difficult? Or were people it's already <laughs> were, were people still judging you by who you were as opposed to who you want to be? Okay, guys 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 will always judge because um you know alcohol being socially acceptable. Guys, most guys are like uh, you can't you can't you can't be like you can't say you were out of the limelight. Am I what messed you up is alcohol. Like we drink mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. So uh, it depends like my psychiatrist like when when I have sessions with a psychiatrist because it's actually a journey. Mm. It's not like a step you just go and it's over. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it's a f you follow up like mm. even out outpatient. Mm. Like what got to me when my psychiatrist was like talking to me. He was like telling me, you know like how there are people who get fat from just eating like mm. a donut. Mm. Uh, Fanta soda, mm -hmm. and there are guys like you who can eat a lot. I eat a lot, mm -hmm. but I don't grow fat. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 their genes. Mm -hmm. So they're like there are guys like you who can drink a little and can mess them up, mm -hmm. and there are guys who can drink a lot. So you can't go comparing yourself with mm -hmm. everyone. Okay. It's it's an individual thing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and on top of it, when when you get to the point that you can't function, you can't go to work, or you can't do things normally. Because you need alcohol, or because you want to have fun or anything, that's a problem now. Okay. That's not having fun. And so today, when you are, you know, that's your new video we are seeing on your screens right now. We'll, yeah. we'll be talking about the music shortly. But you know, when you're going out to perform and people are hyped and they're turned and they're saying, "Yo, Jim, what? Take a drink on me." Yeah. Um, what happens then? That must be tempting. <laughs> yeah, that, that's how it's, it's, it actually started. Because you have like fans everywhere and everything, mm. so you're just mingling and having fun. Um, it's, 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 it just comes naturally, probably with all you've been through and, and everything. You just have to have a, a firm stand. You start like, remember. Yeah, you, 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 mm. you, you figure a point where you're just like, I, I'm, I'm just good with a soft drink. Yeah. yeah. It's not worth it. Yeah. It's, not, it's not worth it. And, and you're at that funny. point, Mamzi, as well, yeah? yeah? Yeah, because, you know, for people like us, you know, we, we, Clubs always want you know that we don't pay interest. Most most clubs they want you there. Once you come there, they want to keep you there. So mm. they give you free drinks, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm. But you have to train yourself. Like you know, for me nowadays I don't go out at all because first of all I get bored. <laughs> I don't drink anymore. Mm -hmm. You know because your friends. You no, know, I'm not saying they're boring. But you know when they start drinking, the stories change. You yeah. know, you don't get it. You, you, you know their their jokes become between them. So yeah. I don't really get into that kind of mix. And. Um, Knowing that my story is out, like here, they know they would respect that. If they are truly fans of ours yeah. and they know that we have this kind of problem, they won't put it in our face like that. You know, they won't be like, "Oh, Bamzi, have a, don't send a drink my way." In fact, yeah. they'll say, "Hey, Bamzi, has not drink anymore. He's doing a good thing. Let me send him a soda or Uji or something mm -hmm. like that. It'll be good." <laughs> okay. So, Jim, what? Um, yeah. Before we talk about your music, for the per person who's watching, yeah. um, or even the families. Who know that their son is addicted to alcohol? Who know yeah. that their mm -hmm. child, or their wife, or their husband, or their sister is addicted to some form of drug, yeah. but are in denial? What's your message to them? Mm, I just say like, um, uh, when it reaches a point that you're not having fun with your fun thing, the the idea of fun thing, you have to reflect and see what's what's really going on but how can parents and the support system around assist because sometimes a person doesn't want to be helped yeah mm. yeah. yeah yeah you know there's, there's there's that thing of being criticized and guys judging you and everything and that's why like that's why we we, we, we usually meet up with bumsy and everything because mm. we make it easier for guys to come up yeah and ac accept it because mm. you know like we've been through a lot and everything we could have hid it mm. and just went on with our lives mm. but through all we've been through it's like you ha I can actually do it. I'm trying to do a song yeah. that will reflect all the challenges okay. and everything about mm. it. So but yeah, like Bamzi Jimot has brought up a very important aspect mm. of criticism. Yeah. The way your family deals with this. You said yours was very supportive, mm. but there are others who say, Yeah, and it's not even the family, even people like us. You know, it's something since now we've come in the open. Everybody, we, we get criticized all the time. You know, people look at like, like us, less the drug addict or mm. things like that. Uh, but um, the, the thing you have to know is you have to take that risk to tell your people or to tell your loved ones what you're going through because at the end of the day, you, you can't live, you'll have a support system even with the family of 
um, what do you say, addicts. Yeah. Because there's something called AA, which is in Kenya, mm -hmm. Alcoholics Anonymous, mm -hmm. yeah. which is something we're re recommended to do as alcoholics or uh, drug addicts, to have a meeting for 90, 90 meetings when you come out of rehab which is every day, mm -hmm. it's a support system, which is very good actually, because you can find friends there, that's how you make new friends by the way, people who are in AA or NA, uh, they have sponsors, people who have been sober for long, they sponsor you, and those are people you call when you have a bad day or a, a bad night in bed, and mm -hmm. then if you're lucky like me and Jimot, uh, you have psychiatrists mm -hmm. who you go for sessions every now and then, mm -hmm. they can help you, that really has um, really helped me okay, a lot. Okay, but for the, for, the, for the families, mm -hmm. how do they go about this, oh, yeah. because it's difficult families, yeah. for them as well. Um, the thing that really helped my family, sorry, I went off track there. The thing that really helped my family was the family sessions. I went but to a before, couple of before you even get there, mm. because I'm imagining a situation mm. where this family is tired of this child. All right. They have been stealing things All from right, the house. Yeah. They come home yes, late. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. One thing that the parents, the family, has to realize is that it's a disease, right? Treat them like a person who's just got cancer. Yeah? Don't treat them like, oh my God, this guy is just stealing because he's, not, he's notorious. Mm. Uh, because he just wants to go drink. No, it's a disease. He cannot help himself. It's just like um, any other disease that you, you have to treat. Yeah. So if you have that in your mind and you look at it from that angle, then obviously you will have, uh, you'll, you'll be sympathetic to that person. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You don't treat them anymore like there is their choice. It's not their choice. They have no control. Mm -hmm. If you go to any um, doctor anywhere in the world, they'll tell you that this is a disease. When a person is um, on withdrawal, you know, they actually, we were, told, yeah, we're told, yeah, uh, we're told, we're told it's a state of um, uh, mental illness. Actually, when I was, when, if some, if, in fact, if, uh, for example, if an um, addict does a crime and is in withdrawal, mm. you know the government of Kenya um, actually judges you as a mental patient. Yeah. Because it, you're not it, in your proper it, state exactly, of mind. Exactly. Because it's a disease. Um, okay. So, so I think that's an important message. Mm. But you were able to bounce back. Obviously, that's why we have that caption. I love it, yes. by the way. We are back. Mm. And you decided, I'm not going to let this thing leave me out to dry. Yeah. yeah. And you decided you're back in music, Jumot. What have you been up to? Um, I've been doing a couple of projects. Um, I'm working on a new album, my new album. Uh, but the ones I've released are collabos because they're, they're new artists who are in the industry. I mean, th when they saw I was back, they wanted to work with me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is one called Tumezuba with an artist. Um, so that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. the one we, we're seeing on our screens right now. What is it about Tumezuba? Uh, Tumezuba was just actually the, the normal going out scene and everything. Mm. So we tried to incorporate the script of how guys go out, how maybe make your mchele and everything. <laughs> it's, it's basically <laughs> just yeah. going out and having fun and everything. So. I can't say there's a moral lesson and everything from it. It's just the normal going out. It's just, because, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, okay, I wonder if we can hear a bit of it later on, but yeah. um, look at me calling you Jim Watt. So good. Um, see, mm. <laughs> Motumia Morogi yeah. has been in our screens for a bit now, but it's part of an entire album, which yes. is sounding very, yeah. very progressive, actually. Uh, yeah, it is. Um, uh, for th that uh, people tell me that kind of sound was wh way ahead of its time. That's why people think that I haven't been in music and I've been gone for long. But I actually did an album that came out earlier this year, mm. and most of it has been played abroad in Australia and uh, Europe because it's got that house kind of music feel. Because I was one of the first artists to do that kind of fusion. Um, so it's it's from an album called. Uh, Are you forgetting the yes, name of your own oh album? Uh, yeah, it's a collection <laughs> album. It's called. Um, uh, Mizuka Hits Collections. Uh -huh. You can find it on wabe.com, which uh -huh. is a Kenyan website for yeah. music. Uh, but what I'm doing right now is working on music because Kenyans, my fans have complained and said, oh, that kind of music is good, the Motumia, but what happens is you've forgotten the ones who love your hip hop, mm -hmm. the ones who like uh, how it came out, like the way we came out back in the day, we yeah. used to rap. So what I'm doing is I'm working on also an album right now, like with Jimot in my own studio, uh, which is going to focus more on the Kenyan kind of hip-hop the, the, the Kenyans liked. Okay. Uh, you know, the bounce and all that, which is going to come out early next year. And obviously, it's, gonna, it's not going to be the same lyrics we used to do before. You know, I can't promote anything to go do with drinking or going out, but I'm not going to, you know, it's not going to be too conservative. It's still going to be the same Bamzi, but with a few morals changed here and there. You all try right. and balance. Yes, exactly. Uh, to try and balance, yeah. Yeah. Um, th which has preempted my question. Mm. Um, has this influenced your work, or do you foresee a situation where your work will be heavily influenced by the experience you've gone through? For some people, that might mm. be an obvious question, like, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> mm. Yeah, definitely, you know. Like, I In what say, ways do you foresee that happening? Um, I'd say, like, I get inspired to write conscious lyrics more. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but I still have my fan base. So from the get-go, I'd, I'd been blessed with an insight for what I used to term as um, edu edutainment. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like under 18, mm -hmm. it's all about, it's, it's a kind of a joke and everything, yeah. mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it has a moral thing. Mm -hmm. Like, eh, hey, chungeni, ah, toy. Mm. Now. Stoic to Kidogo, same thing. You, you're having fun and everything, but at the end of the day, it's like, hey, don't bribe and everything. Mm. So it's the same thing I've, I'm, I'm trying to do. I actually have a song in a pipeline. It's mm. going to be called Gage. Mm -hmm. mm. But I, I'll know how I'll, I'll fix it in exactly. to make it more, more mm. fun and everything. Mm. Um, I've been inspired. I've done a gospel song with an artist called Jedida. Like, you're more conscious. Yeah. It's, mm. it's growth. Yeah. Mm. All those... All those all those things that happen to you, you don't regret, mm. you live and you learn. Mm. So it builds you to be a better person. All right. Yeah. Mm. Um, we've been kicked out of the studio, so oh. we have to wrap up the <laughs> session there. It was a very interesting discussion. Remember, that's the music that you're seeing on your screens. Um, Jumot, where to get your music very quickly? Um, there's a new platform called buymziki.com. So buymziki.com and wabi.com for Wabi .com, yes. and Bumsy's music. Okay, yeah. thank you very much for joining us this morning and sharing your stories. Thank you. And remember, that hotline is on our screens. If you miss it or if you know someone who is looking for it, do not hesitate to get in touch with us. You can do that by reaching us directly on Twitter at Katie and Kenya. We're very responsive, we promise you that. And if you're wary of that, just get in touch with me directly at Edith underscore Kimani.